What's going on, you two? It's the Plus Guys Gaming Podcast, and today we have a special guest with us. Uh, it is Jared Zimmerman. What's going on, Jared? Welcome to the podcast. Hey, welcome, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm. Uh, here today is my co-host, Bill, and What's today up? we're recording on the release of the ban list. So not only do we have a special guest, but we could talk about this ban list that people have been back and forth for weeks. Yep. So, guys, what's your first thoughts on the ban list? Let's, let's just go over it real quick. Let me bring up the site here. And we'll go over all the cards on it. Okay, okay. So, for Forbidden, Union Carrier is banned. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's R- definitely R- cool. P- uh, degenerate. It promotes just, like, intera- not interactive gameplay. You should be able to grab cards from your deck. And just play whenever you want to. So promotes like other card design, Union Carrier. So it's definitely a card that needs to get banned. Mm-hmm. Next on the list, we have Utopic Zexel. No one mm. likes new. <laughs> no yeah. one likes no, you can't play the game. It's the same concept as a uh, VFD. So like in terms of like Zexel to um, Dragoon, there's a lot of comparisons with that because they're both banned in the OCG. Zexel. Dragoon's at least just only one gate. Zexel, you can't play any cards. I would argue Zexel is more uh, degenerate than Calamity because, like, you can't even play, like, spells and traps. So, like, your turn's just done when you get Zexel. Yeah. So, it promotes too unfair of a game state for when you're going first and you're able to successfully play Zexel. That's yeah, right. I can't disagree. I can't disagree with y'all. I mean, RIP, uh, the Numeron package, you know. But, yeah, like, Zexel's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of VFD, next on the list is VFD. Yeah, yeah. it's not for time, right? <laughs> it's about time. It, it, it was unfair the day it came out, and dinos were abusing it. You know, they continue to abuse it for years. Like, yeah. Any card that says your your possession is just instantly a broken card. I think Calamity is the only card that says your opponent's possession. <laughs> I think it was kind of cool when you see the virtual mirror match and they both were making VFDs under VFD effect, you know, but like outside of that, the entire format just couldn't play Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, it had to go. It had to go. The only argument to why I like the card like VFD in the format, uh, VFD popular in a format, promotes trap decks to be a little bit more popular. Uh, compared to like the other answers like Zexel, where you can't interact at all, but like at least the trap decks are able to get a little bit of competitive advantage in formats where calamities is seeing higher play. And uh, we did see that throughout its lifespan. We saw decks like Altergeist come up, and then during the end, we saw Ulrich having success in a format otherwise it wouldn't. But due to the success of the calamities, those decks did see success because of it as like a counteract to the meta. Yeah, but then you got decks like Dogma, who just really can't play under BFD though. Like that's the other point to the, like the control aspect of the, the, the meta game, you know. Absolutely, it's all checks and balances. Yeah, because like when you call lights, and lights was a very fair attribute to call out because it shuts out a lot of stuff, a lot of yeah. stuff. No golden yeah. board. <laughs> that's yeah, all. Never real. Yeah, yeah, like you could and, like and, before nib. It's crazy. And mm. Tisa's effect too that triggers in the graveyard, so you know. If you if you were to do uh, punishment or um, servant, yeah, so. I, I would argue with the ban cards. Like in terms of potency <laughs> to get banned, I actually would argue VFD. Um, it, it, it I don't I think could have been limited. Honestly, I think it would have been fine at the game just being at one. But uh, in terms of importance, I don't think calamity is that important. Like the other like union carrier and well, union carrier thing is the highest that that ban here today. I mean, it does tell us it does make us ask a question with union carrier and link Ross being banned, right? Is Konami going to release more powerful Link monsters that are, you know, just just generic? Or are they going to just go down this path of just chopping off every powerful Link monster that gets abused every format? <laughs> yeah, you, you can see, I mean, I think with an example, I think Exceeds, Synchros, and Links, they always get their generic broken cards throughout Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, you still have, like, um, Zeus right now is in the game. That's an insanely generic Oh, that's game. my favorite card right now. Yeah. That's my yeah. favorite card right now. <laughs> yeah. They're just insane. <coughs> I think they're good for Yu-Gi-Oh. You know those generic power cards. Mm-hmm. Like that's 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 legit. Like I think Zeus and and Jagoon balance each other, so I don't think either of them are going to go away anytime soon. 
right? Because like I do think if you ban Zeus or if you ban Goon, the other would just define the entire format. So like hopefully like they kind of stay together, just like engage and colossus, you know? Yeah, they're definitely like, oh, I don't think there's any threat. Um but yeah, I, I do see both those cards getting banned though eventually. Zeus and Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. both at the same time though, because I'm I'm afraid a format where one of them goes and the other one just becomes the best card ever and it just takes over everything. Like Couldn't agree. Like, a goon could definitely win a game. Like a goon by itself can definitely win a game. <clears throat> to, to go along with that, um let's go into the limited list then of the ban list. Yep. First up is Benton. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss ya. Ah, uh, come on. <laughs> Don't miss ya. Deuces. <laughs> no. Yeah, tell Blockjack I said what's up. <laughs> so uh, with the ten ten, that's definitely a huge hit to the dry tron strap. Uh, it definitely being able to loop ben ten, ben ten adding ben ten is like an a degenerate thing because they're just gaining infinite resource. It kind of reminded me of like Emancipator, how they were able to break Block Dragon. Drytron was able to break like their strategy through Ben 10. And limiting Ben 10 is basically almost the same thing to a degree. And it definitely puts a huge like thing on that strategy. It's going to be a lot harder to get off their combos now. Less, more resources got to go into their combos. I think, I think the deck is still, uh, it's going to be a decent deck. Is it going to be tier one? I don't believe so. Um, you know, I think we once, need to drive for that. Yeah, deck. once they get that that X Y Z and yep. that Herald monster, I yep. think that's going to put them back in the position they were before. But this current moment, yeah, I definitely think they lost a leg. Yeah. In this current or tier two deck, I do think after Lightning Overdrive, they're going to bounce back in that <laughs> tier strategy. If they if you didn't hit Ben Ten on those ban lists, I do feel like Drytron would have been the best deck. So I think it was a very good proactive call to limit the Ben 10 now before it became like a tier zero deck. I mean, between Ben 10 and BFD, who, who took it the worst? As Dry far Trons, as, you know, I think. Triton and Virtual World. I would definitely say the Drytron strategy is a little bit more crippled now, but they're gaining a little bit further support. The Virtual World <laughs> is putting almost support at this point. So, I mean, the, the Drytrons are going to gain that momentum going forward, uh, but the Virtual World deck is still very play. Both decks are still very playable. But as far as meta goes, right, like Tier 1, like, do you do you see Virtual World still being that the, the, one of the best decks, if not the best deck of the format? Yeah, yeah, Virtual World's definitely in the top three best decks this format, still. Uh, yeah. Dry Trump, not put in the top three. Post-Lightning Overdrive, I would argue, but uh, until Lightning Overdrive, no. But I definitely would put, like, an Elric, probably in number one right now, and then... <laughs> Put like a, a virtual world, like two, three spot, and then Dragon Link as well, floating in between there. But those are like the three decks I would say right now. Agreed. Dragon Links. See, I think dinosaurs are definitely up there right now. Like as far as one of the best decks of the format, if not the best deck of the format. Yeah, dinosaurs. All it's a player favorite deck, so there's definitely a lot to that. It's budget friendly compared to some other decks. You can you right. want to put have the cards that's the thing it's been around in the format for like five years now so. and, and they got pot prosperity too now so consistently wise i definitely think that the deck is now pushed in the position where there's no vfd so now you can go full combo without a fucking floodgate right and not to mention you got cards like pot of prosperity that boosts consistently of your deck and you can just play a bunch of hand traps so i definitely think uh out of all the decks that are combo wise and have the opportunity of dominating, I definitely think Dinosaurs is, is, is going to be that force. Like the next big event, I, I could definitely see a bunch of dinosaur decks running top sixteen. Yeah, I mean or I top definitely too. Always in the meta dinosaur, but as far as best deck, I don't think dinosaur is ever there, but it's always a sneaky contender. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well on next, on next on the list. We have zero for the semi limit list. And uh we do have uh the unlimits then to go with. Yep. Yeah. Buster Sword, welcome back home. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, you need. Oh, that card. Firewall is Dragon with an errata. What's the, are you from? The, does anyone know what the errata says? Uh, I know that errata. I just don't know what it says. So you're locked into using Cyber monsters for Firewall Dragon now. So this card's gonna have success in the uh, any Cyber <laughs> strategy you would have, such as like Salomon Greats mm-hmm. or. Uh, Math Max, actually. So wait, it's the same. It's the same card text. It's just you're locked into Cyberus. 
you have to you have to use side earth monsters to make it and then as well you can only <coughs> use special summon from hand effect once is it a uh, yes. is it like a, is it a once hard per, once per turn or like a soft once per turn it is a hard once per turn now Ooh. Mm-hmm. what about the what about the effect to add things back to the hand though from like the great bird yeah. field Quick effects still, and that, that's one of the more powerful effects of Firewall Dragon, I would say, the quick effect to bounce into it. So, you know, you can get... Definitely this adds more to the link climbing ability. We're not seeing that in the meta right now, or if you make, like, anything connecting with arrows where it really matters. If you can put Firewall in, like, the down arrow, and you can, like, connect three, you can do, like, a bounce three on Firewall now. So that's pretty good. Uh, good example. You can take advantage of this, though, due to... um like the their link one so you can just make make a link one and then make a firewall underneath and at least you got to bounce one as an interruption and you can like have your traps as well like your salad traps so uh, i do think salad gets a boost on this band with <laughs> firewall coming off that's one thing so salad and that's going to be very interesting to see them bounce back a bunch of hand traps and then just reuse them again that's going to be very interesting yeah yeah it's an interesting card in the game. I do think it's a lot more fair. The only issue with Firewall is that I think it's one of the most powerful cards ever printed in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, Firewall Dragon, Actually, But with the Arata, it's definitely true. a little that's bit true. more fair. It's not long. It's no longer a generic card. And, of course, the wants per turn is what the card always needed. That's right. And that change takes effect on April 14th. Mm. Yes. Next, we got okay. Rusty. The Phantom Knight, um, that card can be at three. It never need to be limited. It was either, it's a, one of those cards where it's banned or it's at three. There's really no in between because you're only really gonna play one of that card realistically. So, yeah, if 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 anybody's gonna play two or three of them, it's probably gonna be like the pure PK or uh, PK BA variant. But even then, like why when you could just fog blade and bring it back? So you know. Correct. Next, you got Delorn, the Tiger King of the Ice Barrier. You had the new Ice Barrier structure deck come out. Um, I'm not too familiar if Delorn's even used in the strategy. However, I do know this can open up some oddball FTKs now with Delorn being at three. Um, are they consistent? No. So it's really nothing that's worth it that much. But, I mean, there you go. Delorn's back at three. Uh, that's right. Ignister. Is that the is that the Synchro? Yep. Yeah, that, that was, like, good or not, like, Five years ago, I think this card was. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, are we getting pendulum support? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, we, uh, uh, support, but I mean, like this card just—it's too fair nowadays. It has like nothing that's really game breaking. These effects. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You say that now until Kanari releases his broken synchro <laughs> pendulum <laughs> archetype. You know, it's not a negator. It's not electromite. It's fine. It's not a starter. Yeah. Really. You gotta give them something. It breaks boards. It breaks boards, but yeah, and also gives you a free body if I'm not mistaken, right? It does, but like you know, going second, you know, in Yu-Gi-Oh, that's fine. Any cards that break board, I mean, we have like Harvey's Feather Duster, like just and like right, yeah, like just think about like when this card was successful. Like these are banned cards, but the card we're seeing its success. But, like that's fair. they were mind blowingly broken. Now they see like. No, Harvey's a Corsi, but nobody's playing like Red Gecky or so. I don't know. It's a cool extra deck monster, but. You know, <laughs> It's nothing that's game breaking or adding to the strategy that much to be meta relevant. That's fair. Rank up magic, uh, Argent Chaos Force back at three. Uh, don't see it playing at three anyways. So. No, I think you probably would only play one of this card, and it's probably just a searchable card anyway. So. And then we got True King's Return back at three. Uh, that's cool, but can you please give us back, you know, card demise and. You know, dynamite back to three. You know, just just nothing crazy. Just those two cards. You know. Not yeah, <laughs> this is pretty impactful. I would say the true king's return at three. Um, you know, but the <laughs> thing is, the actual true Draco monsters they don't do anything, and they're not adding anything like impactful enough. Everything since masterpiece left, it's it's definitely pretty rough, and they don't have like the support that they used to have anymore. So that's also another hindering thing to the death. demise. Demise floodgates. That's enough. I think demise and floodgates would be enough. Just give us three demises, you know, because pop is very locks you out from drawing. So, you know, like you really can't, you really can't play any of the new pop cards in the deck because both extravagance and prosperity stop you from drawing for the rest of the turn, you know. And desires is kind of bad because it burns through your resources. Now, granted, we have three three returns now, so playing demise might not be as harmful, right, for your consistency, or I want to say consistency, but resource management, but at the same time, though, like, Demise is a strong card, you know? Like, it'd be nice what to play not, Demise again. 
Yeah, they have a horrible Elric matchup as well. True Draco. Do they? they Is do. it that bad? As long as Elric's really in the game, uh, they, they have a really bad problem with the <laughs> Lord. Oh, three, three, three diagrams as well. Almost forgot about that. Three diagrams. <laughs> whoa, yeah, calm not- down. <laughs> whoa, whoa, listen, listen. BFD's banned, so it's not like dinosaurs can abuse diagrams the way they were before, right? So if we're going to bring back diagrams, this would be the perfect time because BFD's banned now. Okay, we can ban this then. <laughs> or, so that's fine. Bring diagram to three badness. Miss? Oh well, hey, bye. <laughs> I'm, I'm for it, so <laughs> that's that's. I mean, that. I mean, I mean, dinosaurs. Honestly, let's just say diagrams back at three. Do you think dinosaurs are going to play diagram again when they have an archosaur that's a better variant of diagram? It gets you a big pill, and it's very easy accessible because of the fact that you have a, a miscellaneous. You just pitch one, and banish one. Like, yeah, like absolutely. honestly, I don't see dinosaurs playing diagram ever again. Like, you know, let's you know, you just you just have a hard on for two kings. I don't know. I mean, with the Earth, true, the Earth, true Draco still around, it's pretty impactful, I would say, being able to uh, switch. The, let the, the, let the Gasm is strong, true, because he rips the extra deck, but, like, what do you do with him without a DFD now? You know, like, what do you go into? Like, are you just playing that just to rip three from your extra deck of your opponent? Like, if that's the case, like, okay, sure, but I don't you, know. Like, level nines. There's um the new level nine ex- came out of the most recent set. You can make a monster negate with it. So. Yeah, you could, you could, you could. You got, you got, you got to make, you got to make Lithogasium, right? And then what? You got to synchro summon to a Trish or something, or are you gonna go fusion to the level level nine fusion off of Banshee three your monsters to make it? Like, like yeah, you could go down that route, but I just feel like dinosaur boys could do a lot better and conserve their resources. It depends on what you're trying to get done. But that, that, once again, this is a hypothetical world. Thing if, if Diagram was at three, which it isn't. But I, I do think if Diagram was at three, though, I think they would be <laughs> three Diagram, three Demise. Just just bring it back next list, you know? Right, guys? Next list? Just we don't need <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, that's, 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 uh, that's the talk about the ban list. Uh, I guess the last thing I ask you guys about the ban list is uh, what do you guys think is going to be the top three decks of the format, though. So uh, I, I reviewed this earlier. I would say the number one deck is going to be some kind of like Elric variant. Uh, I really do think the Golden Lord is going to dominate this format. Now, there's so many different versions now you can make with Elric, so that's definitely very popular. I'd say then the number two and three would be like some Dragon Link or Virtual World strategy. Uh, there's definitely a lot of things you can still do with these decks. So I think a lot of players are really counting Virtual World out, and uh, definitely not a deck you can really count out. They still have a lot of, you know, you can make Dragoon plus uh, Crystal Wing and Trap Card with that sure. deck, with two Virtual World names. So, I mean, that's a pretty hard board to out, the Dragoon with the Crystal <laughs> Wing and, and the, the, tra- the Trap, the Dragon Pop. So there's not too many decks that can really make that board so simple either as well. Okay. Um... Yeah, I agree with Eldritch and all these variants. That will probably take over for a bit. Also, I, I really think something... I, I really think people are going to do something with Dinos. It might not be the second best, but maybe third, maybe fourth. But I feel like we're going to see it a lot. <laughs> I think in that top five spot, yeah. I have Dinos. Yeah, I definitely see him in that top five. Uh, an underrated deck of Shadals, too. I know I, I didn't really talk uh, about yeah. that. Shadal is definitely underrated because they have a good um, Elric matchup. <laughs> uh, kind of counteracting the meta. That's kind of what always Shadal is. The Super Poly is amazing. You can take their Golden Lord and make a construct with it. So that's another thing. Y'all think Invoke doing anything? <laughs> Any Invoke variants? Um, I, think, I think this upcoming format is going to take a nosedive of a shift. And the reason why I say that is because because VFD is no longer here, cards like Magician Souls is going to become more impactful. Cards like Triple Tactics is going to become more impactful. Uh, so I think a lot of people are kind of rushing towards the Super Negate decks and the Super Combo decks because of the fact that they spent like three to four months not being able to go that strategy. But in my honest opinion, I think decks like Elder Lich is going to be super strong. Uh, decks like Dogmatica 
and, and, and Vogue is going to be super strong. Uh, decks like Shadals are going to be super strong. I think we're going to be walking into a control format. I, I, I don't think uh, super combo decks like Dragon Links uh, and, and for Nobles, I don't, I don't think they're going to have a really good time only because of the fact that, you know, because VFD is gone, these other control strategies besides uh, Edelich are, are going to have a good time to play. I think um, you made some just points there with like Calamity being out of the format. Uh, there's definitely yeah. some cards that are going to see Uprising. Like you mentioned Triple Tactics. I definitely yeah. see back in the battle. Because because hand traps, like, like let's be honest, right? If you're playing a deck that can run 12 to 15 hand traps, like, and still be able to put on a board, you're going to have a pretty decent time. Yeah, and a lot of these things aren't activating during the stand <laughs> anymore. They're going to be activating during the main phase one, where Tactic can take more advantage of that. Uh, I yeah. do think hard, like Dark, uh, Dark Roller No More is going to start to see more play as well. Uh, it yeah. would play because of Calamity, because, you know, <laughs> Dark Roller does nothing to Calamity uh, compared to Dark Roller, which is going to be able to out these, because it's going to go back to negate boards again compared to, like... I can see know, Mystic Mind yeah. returning again. Like, 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 Mystic Mind would definitely have higher impact now because, all right, um, besides Edelich, you know, Virtual Worlds and Drytons don't have a very good time when they see a Mystic Mind. Now, in, a, in an optimal world where you have two banished cards and a trap card, yeah, you can pop it, but, you know, given how the, the direction Virtuals might take, how consistently can they put a trap card out with a pop? Yeah, I, dis I disagree with that statement pretty hard. Um, you can always out the mystic mine with all the tier decks because dragon link consistently out it as well you can consistently out it with the elric of course and you have searchable ways to get it out and then well, uh, elich El 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 can elich can but dragon links it, it, it's kind of hard if you beat out the, the negation like if you beat out the negation slap mystic mine on the table how do they answer it um let me i have to check on a card text but i i can do... can that trap card can the dragon main trap card bounce a spell that is what I'm checking right now. I'm a little bit unfamiliar with the <laughs> Dragon Maid Trap card. I'm, I'm searching it right now on the database as we speak. Um, hmm. Don't they have like some kind of negate or something? Well, Dragon Maid can put a Savage Dragon on board with a Heretic Seal yeah, you, and, yeah, and a I, Trap card. <laughs> the Trap card returns it. So Okay, so they have to bait out the bounce and the negation and slap the Mystic Mind on the table. And they usually end on like two negates and the trap. So I don't know. Like I guess you got it on the fourth one. Good for you. You know. <laughs> I mean, people way. were playing Mystic Mind when Spirals is running around. So you know, like yeah, bad players will play bad cards. I don't. I don't think Mystic Mind's a bad card. Like I think from its from its creation, like it's it's definitely been high impact, especially in resolves. It, it's high impact, but uh, ever since Elric really came in the format. The Mystic Mind, as I would argue, has been had zero impact on the meta since Elric has came in the format. Just because, oh yeah, like, Conquistador Pop, yeah, it's pretty free. Conquistador Pop, yeah, <laughs> really hard to play a card like that, especially when you're considering this is going to probably be the one of the more popular formats that Elric has ever had now. So, like the like, you're not going to want to prioritize something like that anymore. I'm actually surprised Brad Reboot didn't come back because I've noticed a pattern. Konami just brings back back removal cards like on each list. You know, like Harpy yeah. Fest, Fest, uh, Harpy Fest, Fest, and stuff like that. But no cards really came off the, to talk about. Nothing really relevant came off the list. That's really you know game changing at all. I I can only assume that they have new archetypes coming on the way, and uh, they're gonna be they want to give them a chance. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, three new sets coming out. I think <laughs> endless. So you have the Gold Series set coming out. You have the Ancient Guardian set coming out, and then you have. Lightning Overdrive coming out, so that's like three sets before the next ban loss. So there's yeah. definitely a lot that can change up in between there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, honestly speaking, though, like with the Lightning Overdrive set, nothing. I don't think they really uh, uh, like spoiled anything or confirmed any new like one of the OCG imports and stuff. But I do have high hopes for that set. Um, I definitely do have high hopes. Yeah, I think once we, we we talked about this before, but I think the Drytron strategy is going to um, really take off once we get the Exceed monster. So, I yeah. mean, I think they're still playable till then, but when they get that Exceed monster, it's kind of going to make up for that void back then. Next year's going to be kind of spicy, too, because now, you know, 
are they still going to play like the Zeus package and stuff, or you know, like, like, like some of the stuff that they're running now, like Axis Go Talker and then that Link Two uh, Switcheroo Monster and stuff. Like, like how is that actually going to adapt to that, especially the prosperity strategy? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of different versions they can go around. Uh, Pot of Prosperity too. Just let's talk about that <laughs> card. But uh, I think it's like insanely good in like all the tier one decks right now. Like very good. Um, yeah, it's definitely new desires. It's definitely yeah, new desires. New desires vibe to it. It's like the card to run. Um, I do expect that card to keep going up in price as like it's going to keep seeing more <laughs> play. Also, against these like back row decks, it's very important because once you're sided in, you can like dig deeper for like these lightning storms and for the evenly matches and for the harpy's feather duster where you have more successful odds when you're going second now to just blow out the trap cards. Being so game to... one, when your opponent activates the pop prosperity, do you ash it? Uh, if it's their opening move, no, no, not game one. Okay. Okay. Definitely not correct. You definitely would want to hold your resources until further notice. Cause next thing you know, they just drop like a red eyes <laughs> on you and then you just cry. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. That car, that car hurts feeling. I, I, I play the deck. It's still like, when I see the cross me, it hurts so many feelings. When I see the yeah. Card. I love that card. <laughs> Normal summon rise. <laughs> that's really powerful, but that's something. That, uh, like, Dragoon is the format. It's going to be very popular. This format Dragoon, even more I think, format. I think it's even harder now to know what to ask. Cause like uh, a couple days ago at locals, like, I was just holding my ash because it's like, you know, you play a combo deck, they can turn, they like they they can turn to a crazy board. You know what I'm saying? It's like, do I ash this or, you know, do I wait for them to summon ash? Because you know, prosperity can get you the rash fusion. You know, like like decks like PK and stuff. It's just so hard to know what to ash because it just fits out a board. And sometimes they can just go activate rash fusion, set fog way past. Like. It's just so hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> to go along with that logic, when you said it's so hard with Ash, I do think um, that hand traps are not very good this coming format because I, I just feel like the, the trap cards are actually just more impactful than these hand traps compared to what you're trying to stop is not that impactful. <laughs> and just setting your traps, even once your opponent combos, you can just break your opponent's board that way instead of just trying to be a preventive way with hand traps. You can more have like a proactive way through just like playing like ways just to break through their board instead of the hand traps i think we're going to see more of that compared to see i followed that i followed that philosophy because at the the previous hundred man uh, regional tournament uh pa you know i too went in there with elich goons right our decks were kind of similar and kind of not similar because you're playing the punishment uh shadow package with the aerial which i thought was very cute like i, I like that idea i'm not sure if it was yours or not but i definitely like that idea um but after playing Zodiac Edelich, I definitely believe that hand traps have a place, uh, especially when you open up multiple and you have a follow-up, you know? But I definitely think trap cards are really powerful right now, too, because they stop the problem and they remove a problem at the same time, especially playing cards like, you know, Ice Dragons, Torrential, Strike, you know, even Punishment, too. Like, like just... I, the fact that you could punishment, send Al Capone, Al Capone sends Ariel, and rip a card from the board. So you just got, you just pop the monster on the board, and then you just rip three cards out of your opponent's graveyard. That's insane. <laughs> That's freaking yeah. insane. <laughs> it's really, punishment's a, a heck of a good card, this format. And uh, yeah. I see more and more play of that card as well. <laughs> punishment is going to be uh, a defining card of the format. But I think punishment is fair, though, because you locked yourself out your extra deck, you know, for the next turn as well. So I yeah. definitely think it's, it's fair. Contract. Yeah, I I like I like those. They're, they're totally fine to have. Um, a back row cards are gonna just really popular <laughs> move. Like we're gonna see cosmic, I believe, in the main deck. Just just the way the format's gonna progress, I believe that's gonna be very popular. Because I think every deck's gonna be playing some sort of trap cards to a degree. Right. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that one. Like like control is so gonna be. Overwhelming this format. So you better you better have the lightning storms in your in your side deck. You better have you know an Ely match or you know a red reboot you know or Cosmic Cyclone something to answer that back row. You're gonna see it a lot of it. Yeah, if you if you let your opponent just sit on that back row, they're they're gonna blow you out. And so you're definitely gonna need to play cards that answer the back row cards going in this format because control is gonna take over here. Do you see strikers? Finding room in this current format that's coming up. Like, do you see strikers ever like top three, top ten? You know, like 
Uh, Shrek is always like a vibe deck with the right pilot. I mean, you can go anywhere with Striker, I would say. Um, they're not like a... They're, there's so many decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! now you can play, which is so different than like before, I would say. Like, in terms of like playable decks, there's like 50 playable decks. So, um, mm. yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they're definitely playable, Striker. Uh, you can win a tournament with them. Cause I, like I said, I think there's about like 50 decks right now I have measured out, which I think are like tournament winning. Let's not forget the Bird deck as well. The Bird deck's also insanely... Oh, you talking about uh, Tribigate? Yeah, the, oh, the bird yeah. deck. Yeah, the statue. The statue is pretty annoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Annoying. yeah like there's definitely like there's so many like guru you got going on as well. Um, uh, <laughs> just yesterday at locals, this dude literally went city set guru flip guru search penis activate fusion. I was like, wait, 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 hold, hold. Yeah, I that. I was like, oh, they, they, they didn't know something. They didn't know something. <laughs> it's really hard to beat what they do. Like when they go when they go city guru, then they then they get this. So then I, I I don't like that interaction. How they're able to like keep flip summoning guru, aiming that yeah. uh, red eyes fusion restriction, and uh, yeah. really boosted that deck up consistency wise because now they're like always opening a pot card, which usually is like guaranteeing them access to like hidden city <laughs> red eyes fusion. So like. They're really going off at one point. The only thing that deck really struggles going second, but I mean, it can always bite you in the early rounds of tournaments. A guru deck, I feel like, especially um, when the die roll. Yeah, they win that die roll. You're playing from the back seat, like you're you're in the very back. Very You're instantly. I think your win percentage against guru or any deck. I don't care what you're playing. I think it's like goes down to like twenty percent, twenty thirty percent if they win the ice roll. It's definitely very low. Uh, I mean, that's when hand traps come in, though. Honestly, I think that's when hand traps really come in. Uh, the thing is, like, there's not much you're hand trapping though during this situation. Like, I guess I'll, I'll hand trap the city. You can, you can, but then they just flip fusion. You're still in a dragoon, you know. I mean, like, I mean, even... they they summon a dragoon, and then there's no, there's like, okay, so if city resolve, there's two the gates. If city doesn't resolve, there's one in the gate. You know, like if Dragoon... they don't open up the guru. Yeah, dragoon flip. There can only be one. You know, how many decks really have an answer to that? That's hard. That's, that's like, 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 that, that's, like that's a thing. Like, how many decks have an answer to that? You have to ask yourself. And, uh, I, th I think that's just when you're playtesting as a player. When you when you compare a deck, you need to ask yourself. You know, look at a deck, and then just think about what cards it plays, and, and can you answer that? And if the answer is no, you you a that deck you're trying to play is not playable, or b you need to find a way to be able to play through these boards of popular decks. That's, that's I mean, cool. I mean maybe Guru. Maybe Guru might take over. Like it might be Guru Red Eyes versus Edelich variant. You know? Yeah, you're you're gonna see Gurus. They're definitely uh, like a Guru is like the modern day True Draco. I would say where where, where the spot where True Draco was at. You know, during Striker format, Thunder format. I I would put like that's about the level of what you know Guru is today. They're not uh not the best deck, but you definitely need to keep your eyes on a deck like that because th their power level is insane. You know, just the floodgates and then just Dragoon as well. It's, that's an insane card. That's very true. So, so for the listeners, for the listeners, Jared, uh, that don't know you, right, or don't know you well, right, tell us a little about your background. Like, when you first got started, like, what year did you start playing uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! casually and then competitively? Yeah, I, I always, like, played Yu-Gi-Oh! like, my entire life, but, uh, I, I played, like, when I was a kid, of course, and then I, I really only got, I took a, a big break, I, I, I quit playing around the Spellbooks Dragon Roller, when it was, like, Year Zero format, so this was, like, Nationals 2013, Yep. and then I quit playing until 2018, in January, I came back, um, and I, it was like Pendulum FTK format, True Draco. And I decided to play Trick Stars then. And uh, during that first year I got in the game, I had numerous tops. Uh, those were with ARGs. And then uh, I had a Nationals top, so the North American Championship in Texas. I topped that like my first like few months back in the game. Honestly, if I, I go back and look at myself at that time, that it still blows my mind how I talked to Nationals because I really didn't fully understand the game. I would say back. So then. were you were you uh like like let's let's just talk about your circle right when you were playing competitively in 2018 right? Uh, did you have like a friends at locals that you played with, college friends, you know, high school friends? Like, like let's talk about that. Like, what helped you get back into the game and translate and progress yeah. so fast? 
Yeah, so so coming in the game, um, YouTube, I, I learned, was way bigger of a resource than what it was back in, like, 2010, like, Billy Break era. Uh, like, the YouTubers who actually are out there now put out, like, good content. Like, they actually know what they're talking about. Um, so, like, the, honestly, what got me into it was, like, a suggested <laughs> video from Team Samurai back into it again. I didn't even know what Yu-Gi-Oh! was doing nowadays. I, I had no idea about it. I was like, oh, wow, this looks really cool. And I realized I had some free time now. And that, that's kind of where I got into the game. You know, just going to my local card shop and picked it up from there. But uh, I went to a local tournament. Uh, I met a friend, Jared Randolph, who's also very successful at this game. And uh, he kind of took me under his wing and uh, really progressed me as a player and changed just the way I, I look at cards and the way I analyze cards. Hmm. All right. So, so would you say your success, the root of your success at your early stages of 2018 was a result of uh, you YouTubers? What was the result on being a competitive team, which is Wolfpack at the time? I'm assuming that was yours. yeah. So Wolfpack Gaming. I would I would say there's there's two factors in there. I definitely agree. You can't get enough research. Um, I relate like this game kind of similar traits to uh, football. I'm a huge football fan, and uh, it's honestly just that this game is about watching tape more than playing the game. You definitely should be watching more than you're playing, and uh, I think just a student of the game, you can learn more than being a player of the game. So I kind of just took a moment and sat back and just watched the game, just watch people play on Dueling Look. Um, I watched some really good players who are, in, uh, you know, just, you know, I, I, no matter how I feel about them personally, how they feel about myself, um, you know, I really watched them play. Uh, one of my favorite players ever is Jeff Jones. And uh, this is when he was on his tear as well. I was watching Jeff Jones and just kind of getting feedback from him. Um, you know, you had guys like Cody Angeloff who are really just doing great things and uh, just watching so many deck profiles then on YouTube with guys like Bortle who put the stuff out there and like Slim who, who go to all of these events to, you know, just record all this data and just being able to look at it and then understand card choices, why they're making these decisions and using that information, progressing it for myself as a player. So I think it's just really looking at your competition, see what they're doing. And maybe ways that what you can do, what they're doing, but maybe even better. Mm. So when you when you go to an event, right? Let's just say because you know we're in COVID for we're we're in COVID, so you know, we don't have the opportunity of going to a YCS, you know, going to a regional, right? Let's just take a you know step back to 20, 2019, you know, before COVID hit, right? When you used to go to an event, right? Um, how many players in that room of, let's just say, a thousand players, did you perceive as someone that was, you know, uh, an equal or an rival, you know, an actual threat at the table? So when I go to a tournament, um, if, if I'm going to a tournament, I'm prepared for the tournament. So I believe if you're going to a tournament and you're not prepared, I don't know why you're there. In mm -hmm. my opinion, because mm -hmm. if you don't think you're the best person in that room when you go to mm -hmm. a tournament, you don't deserve to be in that room. Mm. So that's kind of my logic between there. There's no single person when I go to a tournament that I view that's better than me. I know they could be way more accomplished than me, and I respect all their accomplishments. But when I go to a tournament, I know the preparation work that I did to get to that tournament and with my deck and with my play style and everything to build up for that event, where I believe that I'm the most prepared duelist in that room. Now, don't get me wrong, there has been some events where I, I, I don't try as hard, but if I really am aiming to do successful at that event, then I have no doubt where I'm the best player in that room, and I have that confidence to do so, because I do believe confidence is everything. I respect that. I respect that. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of, that's something a lot of people should uh, have when they go into a tournament, too. Yeah, I, yeah. Definitely, I definitely had this argument a couple of months ago about your perception of yourself as a competitive player. You know, someone, someone, someone suggested that that conception could be considered delusion, right? If you yourself don't match the standard that you put yourself to. Correct. Yeah. If you don't, um, you don't set high standards for yourself, are you really going to be successful? And uh, I look at this, this is outside Yu-Gi-Oh! success as well, too. I use this concept. You need to be looking at all areas that you can constantly approve. And you need to be hard on yourself. You need to look at areas when you lose a game. Why did I lose that game? A lot of players want to be like, oh, my opponent just had it. 
Mm-hmm. Well, maybe you're, there's a reason why your opponent just had it. Was it your deck? Was it ready for what your opponent had? Or was there something that you could have maybe done that was a little bit more proactive to the reason why you could have done that? And I think if you start looking at the game at prospect, you're going to become a better player compared to if you just say, oh, my opponent just had it, which is where I feel like a lot of the players do feel like. I hate two things at a big event, or just an event period, right? First thing I hate is after the round, someone comes to me and they start talking about their game that they just played. <laughs> Don't care. <laughs> Don't <wanna talk> about <laughs> That's always the fun part, though. You always want to go over to your friends and talk. Oh, my yeah. God. I can't believe what happened. That's like a I, I, I love that Don't part. talk about it. And there's another part where you got the guy that just complains about, he had all the answers. There was nothing I could do. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, and I'm like, I'm just sitting there like, you might be right, but like 90% of me is saying, you had some ways to get out of that situation. You just didn't see it. A lot you of know? ways, like getting out of it, maybe that game, but I think a lot of players just have poor deck building. Like they're not prepared for like, when you sit down against your opponent, that game should be decided before that game even begins because your deck should be prepared enough for that matchup. It, you should be studied, you should understand their deck fully, be prepared for that, and as well, just make sure you're teched as well for that matchup and ways to defeat them. Like, you need to have a strategy to defeat every single deck. So well, I think... I think, I think huh? Uh, one thing I just think that players don't do enough is they don't they don't look at every single deck. They look at, like, the top one or two decks, mm-hmm. and they figure out ways to defeat those decks. But they don't look at, like, all these road decks. I talk about how I literally think there's, like, 50 playable decks right now in Yu-Gi-Oh!, they don't understand what all those decks do. And, and you know, when you go to like a tournament like a YCS, you're going to face some, some rogue decks. Like, you have no yep. idea what the heck they are. You're not always going to be facing these tier one decks out of the gate. Yep. So, and uh, yep. a lot of players do take some early losses. And honestly, that's where, you know, you're just not topping. That can be a huge difference why you're not topping. You know, it's just being prepared for everything and at least understand what's your weakness and ways to get over that weakness and not be in that okay. spot. I got destroyed at locals yesterday by plunder patrols. Like I got yeah, destroyed. A, who knows what plunder patrols? You know, like you know, put, uh, put your you know comments below. Do you know fully what plunder patrols do? I don't. Nope. Honestly, I don't. I'm not prepared. If I face plunder, I I'm confused. You know, I'm breeding cards and I I opened up <laughs> two golden boys in my hand and I'm just trying to play Yu-Gi-Oh, right? And you know, I'm reading these cards and I'm thinking to myself, well, this deck isn't too crazy, right? And it gets to a point where he has a monster negate, a, a, a banish for back row, and I believe a, 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 a banish for monsters too, right? And I'm just like, dang, this is kind of, kind of good. <laughs> You know, this is, this is kind of good. Right. Yeah, those yeah. rogue decks can always catch you off guard, especially when you don't know what they're doing, because you uh, you end up you're you're setting up their plays meanwhile, because you have no idea what their strategy is trying to do. Yeah, so you know, I definitely I definitely think you're right on that on that one. You know, educating yourself on the format in its entirety, not just the yeah. top three decks, the top five decks, but also the rogue strategies as well. If you don't come with a game plan, if you're not prepared you will get wrecked, you know? It will send you home early. Yeah, <laughs> It's a harsh reality. A lot of players just don't want to face that, but it, uh, you know, definitely is a, uh, it's a harsh reality. It's all about being prepared. You can't stress that enough. That's definitely the most important aspect to this game is being prepared. And a big thing to prepare honestly, for is time. That's a big thing to prepare for. You know, I uh, think it, I, I, I mean, I don't know. Time, I don't think, is as important as what people think it is. I think that when a lot of players have some time issues, it's usually one player isn't prepared enough for the match. And then they find themselves where they're thinking or taking a little bit too much longer than what they should be in their moves. And all of a sudden, they look at the clock, and there's five minutes left, you know, and it's game three. And uh, I think some players know how to take more advantage of those situations. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's ever a position you should just try to get yourself into. And I think just as a player, you need to make sure you don't fall into the wrong end of time. I think knowing the scoop is important too. Like if you want game one and you're in game two in a bad position, yes. like this is from me perspective, this is for me personally speaking, right? If I won game one, I'm in game two with like 17 minutes on that clock. And I know I'm not going to win this situation or it looks really bad for me. I'm going to just scoop it up and just hard reset this. Let's go to game three. 
too many players try progressing games when they're, you know, it's done. Um, I think a, a really good aspect, I, I play some chess every now and then. And uh, mm-hmm. like, you scoop up in chess way before the match is like on checkmate, like in competitive chess. So, so they scoop like, in chess? But you should do that in Yu-Gi-Oh as well. You need to, you know, it, there, it's okay to scoop up if you don't think you have it. And it's also, sure. like, well, in chess, it's in terms of more being polite. But in Yu-Gi-Oh, you know, you're, you're just wasting time for your opponent. But as well, that's why you're finding yourself maybe in time situations more commonly than not. Hmm. I know they scoop in chess. I, I know that. That's, that's, that's actually good to know, though. That's definitely good to know. Um, I, I, do have, I do have one question I want to ask, though, Jared. So when you go to an event, right, you're a competitive player, so you already feel the stresses of being a competitive player because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a performance-based, you know, job or hobby, you know, whatever. You know, it, it could go for you or anybody you know, involved, right, you know. You already have that pressure of performing, right? But then you have the stigma behind you, right, when you go to the event. So how does that feel for you when you go? Yeah, how do you deal so with it? I definitely have a lot of haters um, inside the game and uh, outside the game. But uh, I, I don't live this life to please anyone besides myself mm-hmm. and those who I care about. And uh, mm-hmm. honestly, just kind of the way I feel about things, if you're not someone I care about, it is what it is. If you feel that way, you feel that way. But, you know, uh, my personal interactions, I, when I create anything with someone, I try to make sure it's the best personal interaction I can create with that person. And mm-hmm. in most of the time, it's with people who I never met before in my life. I have no idea who they are who have these negative interactions with me. So I can't change anything about how people feel about me who I never meet. And honestly, I I think if I wasn't successful, I would not have the amount of haters that I nearly do. And I just think that comes with anything, <laughs> with success, so will come haters. Yeah, it magnifies everything, good and bad. That's that's the curse of success and fame. Correct, yes. Uh, do I have some bones in the graveyard? Absolutely. Um, you know, it happened years ago, things that I, I regret, but... You know, I think we're all human, and it's just about the way how you perceive yourself. And I, I try to perceive myself to anyone who does create an interaction with me to be positive. However, I, I can't fix interactions where I never had with people and, and, you know, emotions, how they feel about myself, you know, who I never so, met. So do you see yourself playing into the, into the character they perceive you as, or, or do you try to show them who you truly are as a person? Um, so I kind of, I don't know. I like to be perceived as a competitive player, as who I am. Um, you know, if people have negative feelings about me, I might, of course, I'm not maybe going to be the most friendliest person attitude-wise towards them because it's pretty hard to be very friendly to someone who's going and ex- feeling extremely hateful towards you. Because it's uh, some levels of hate I get aren't even, you know, it's not minimal. I definitely get some, like, to a point where I feel like it's illegal amount of hate on me. Um mm. Uh, you know, it's definitely where, you know, where like, they, like my safety starts becoming concerned. Um, mm-hmm. that, that, like, it's almost like a, like a serial, like, on it. I don't know. It's, I'm trying to think of the wor- word for it. But, yeah, I mean. Like, 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 like some, like a stand or something? Like, you think you have a stand? Because at the end of the day, a, a, someone who hates you but obsesses over you can still be considered a fan, Right. Yeah, I, I would just say there, there, there's people who are just obsessed about me, but they're obsessed about me for the wrong reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wish that, you know, just <laughs> to those people, you know, I wish I was irrelevant to you because honestly, at the end of the day, they're irrelevant to me. So I think they should be or I should be irrelevant to them as well. Because end of the day, you know, this is a hobby for me. And it's definitely something that I do play competitively because I enjoy it that way. But you know that that shouldn't get in the way of your life and it doesn't and your whatever you do doesn't get in the way of my life so let me live my life and you know you go live your life but that, that's kind of the way what i've used my haters okay so as someone who's you know shown a lot of success in recent years do you do you consider yourself a a pro player or do you believe uh, it's actually a pro player in the Yu Gi Oh scene at all yeah, I don't consider anyone a pro player. Um, you're not making really real money playing this game. This is just something that w- when you what you win in Yu-Gi-Oh is pride. You're not actually mm. winning like things. You know the things are cool, but it's end of the day, it's pride. It's a hot <laughs> to what you're doing. So, 
you know, the America never had a world champion as well either. So, you know, honestly, we ever really, I don't think we have saw the best player play yet in America, if you want my opinion. So I think we need to prove Oh, ourselves. you don't think, you don't think America had like, like any of the best players ever to play the game? No, no, not a, absolutely not. We never had a world champion. So there's no way. I mean, to be fair, though, the world format is more similar to the OCG than the TCG, though. It's a format they're not prepared for as well, either. Um, both, it's a mixture of the things that come up. I think uh, a lot of those players just feel so – they need to prepare more for that event. You know, you should be thinking about that long term. If you're really in that world's gr- grind, that r- race for world's grind, you need to be prepared more. And I, I think so, there's a, a good amount of players that know if they're in contention for, you know, to go to Worlds. I would say about every year there's about 250 players about who are in the contention to maybe go to Worlds, you know, who are actually going to get to that level. And, you know, so I you, think – yeah. So, so, so let's just hypothetically speaking, right, you get to Worlds in 2022 or 2023, whenever this pandemic is over, right, and we're going to get back to the regular smuggler program, right? If you were to go to Worlds and you were to win it, do you think you would be considered a an American great talent than, let's just say, someone like Jeff Jones or Billy Brake or Patrick Holbin, uh, you know, guys like that, like guys who've been consistently topping and doing things for quite a long time? Yeah, I mean, Jeff, I, I mentioned Jeff Jones is like my inspiration to this game. I think he is the best American player to ever play this game, in my, mm-hmm. in my belief. Mm-hmm. Um, but I believe that winning is everything and championships are everything. So mm-hmm. I do believe the next duelist that, you know, if there's an American duelist that wins the world championship, they will be crowned the best duelist to ever play in America. Mm-hmm. Due to that. Thanks. That no matter one what event, for that one chip though. <sighs> uh, I mean, if you win. Super Bowl, it's a yeah. world championship. Now, how big's a world championship? You know, you did the highest thing you could possibly do in Yu-Gi-Oh! Yep. And I think a lot of players don't view it that way. I don't know. I view Worlds as by far the most pristine and highest thing ever. Me too. And I think that's where Americans have some issues. I don't think they value it. They don't want it as much. And I think life's about how bad do you <laughs> want it. If you want it, you're going to get it. It just depends. Are you willing to work that hard for what you want? And, uh, you know, how many so, people really do that? So do you see do you see uh, yourself doing the world's grind uh, if that ever comes back with the regionals and you know? So in terms of the regional grind, absolutely not. Um, for one, that is way too much time into the game as well. Just like personal life, I just have way too much going on. I wouldn't sacrifice that for that. Mm. Um, mm. But in terms of just, I I believe the North American Championship. You know that would be the way. If, if just go Nats, kick right? ass. Get get that win, go to Worlds, collect yeah. another win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now I do think, like, I also just think the players who do the Worlds grind, I think uh, I, I think most of them are the best players. However, <laughs> there is definitely some missing along there who do the Worlds grind race just due to, um, I don't know, maybe that's how badly you want it. I don't, maybe I just don't want it as badly as what they do too, you could argue. So, you know, that's why they could be a little bit more prepared. I just think it's it's way too much of a, a financial resource to do the world's grind. And then that's as well as like time commitment as well. Like I know I think it's way more expensive money. in America because you got to drive from state to state. You might get like an Airbnb or a hotel room. Like I know people who fly for regionals um, when they really do fly. Oh, wow. wow. I, I think I, I, I met someone who did it before. I'm not going to mention names or anything, but I think his total That's expenses fine. for the year was around $20,000. Did he go to Worlds? Did he go to Worlds? <laughs> he, he, did not, he did not. He did not, but he went to the Worlds. But it, uh-huh. it was about 20000 in travel between the food, the, the travel in terms of like being a, a bus, a train, or a, a flight. And then his hotel cost, it was about $20,000. Don't, don't say names. Don't say names. But is he wealthy? Does he come from a wealthy family? Or does he, you know what I'm saying? Like These people I do know, they um, it, it's more likely than it, it's daddy's money than their Okay. Uh, that, okay. that, that's so, what it's, it, it, who you do find, I'm not saying everyone who does the world's race <laughs> is more that. But um, most of these people you are finding, it's more daddy's money. Who are They're very young if you look <laughs> at people who do the world's race. They're not. 
you're not going to find many people, you know, over the age of 30, for an example, doing the world's grind race. We got rent to pay um, and it's mortgages. It's just about financial time. You have work, you know, like th- these are people who, you know, you have to leave on Friday. And like, what about your wife, your kids and everything? And I, I, there, there's more to life than Yu-Gi-Oh, yeah. you know, and there, you can use other things of Yu-Gi-Oh and life and it, it interacts together, you know? Hmm. I mean, honestly speaking, I think in the only in the Yu-Gi-Oh community can you find so many different uh, demographics come together and share a, a common interest. Right? Oh, mm-hmm. I agree. I never saw anything that brought together so many demographics. Besides, like even sports does not doesn't bring as many because you have like yeah. in sports. How many? I, I'm not like, but how many Asians do you really see with sports? You, you know, yeah. you see some, but like we could, we could we could talk about ethnicity. We could talk about uh, uh, social economics. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot, a lot of diversity in Yu-Gi-Oh. Even in oh, genders, yes. too. Even in genders. Know, like, like yeah. there's a lot of women who play the game. You know, there's a lot of them. <laughs> I know you people know? who, you know, who make, like, uh, seven figures who play Yu-Gi-Oh. And then I know people who make, you know, under, like, uh, like three, five thousand a year who play Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so I mean, like there's such a difference between, and I think that's what one thing I love about the game is you get to meet so many different people, and just being able to interact with so many different people that you never would meet before. That that you lets me introduce myself to. Yeah. So um, I met some really good friends from this game, and, and some lifelong friends, and I'm really appreciative of that. I do think though the age disparity in Yu-Gi-Oh is not as big though as it is in like the smash community because of like you know in the recent years the controversy and stuff you know i don't think that type of stuff will ever come to the Yu-Gi-Oh community because with the age gap right you know you need a parent to go to events like you know what i'm saying like they they separate the events with the dragon whatever and regular event now that's know? one i think konami does really <clears throat> awful long the dragon dolls they need to promote that way more than what they do because i believe that the future generations of this game are everything when we see those kids play Yu-Gi-Oh today they are yeah. tomorrow generation because i was once one of those kids i remember yeah, being one of those kids so and, and there's a couple of them right now well i'm not sure they still play or not but there was a couple of them in 2019 you know who came into like the irregular event and they came kicking ass you know uh, yeah, Eddie Ryan Stoltz. Yu, John Wilkin, Eddie Schramm, you know, like, just the ones I know personally, you know, like, they, they definitely, they definitely showed up and showed out. Yeah, uh, Ben Levine, what he used to be with, um, uh, what's his Hoban. name? Um, Hoban, like, that was another kid who was, you know, unfortunately not playing anymore, but crazy, you yeah. know, like, how these kids make an impact. I really do think, like, I'm not saying myself either. I don't think I, I think the best player to ever play in America has not played this game yet. And I believe the competitive shape of Yu-Gi-Oh is going to change so much. And I, I think we're going to see so many new faces once COVID's done. And we do have these real events. I think we're going to see a lot of new competitive faces, which are going to blow away these competitive, these players who think they're the best um, today. They're going to blow them away. <laughs> There's a lot of, a lot of good new blood out there. Yeah, I definitely agree with that sentiment. I definitely think the new blood is, gonna, is going to get rid of the old. Um, and I, I do definitely believe that, you know, some of these uh, established, uh, established brands, you know, or, you know, established teams are, are going to fall out of flavor. I'm not going to name names, but I definitely think they're going to fall out of flavor when, you know, the pandemic is over. Because, you know, you got to think about it, you know, what the tools that you had to to build those dynasties, they're going to be gone because a lot of these younger talents are not young anymore. They're not as ambitious. They're not as motivated. You know, like I talked to players who play for quite a while now. They hate the game itself. You know, they didn't want to play test. You know, when they, when they play at an event, that's when they're playing. Besides that, they're not play testing. They're not grinding. Like, what I talk about that is, um, I think it's a logic of how bad do you want it logic again. And I just think that going like, you know, there's more people who want it now than some of these people used to want it before. And they're just falling out of favor. I think that's anything. That's like with sports. Um, an example, but, but you do have some of these all time greats who will hold on to that. Look at a guy like Tom Brady with football, you know, he's 43, but he wants it more than that rookie. 
Yeah. You know, so it's yeah. really about how bad do you want it, and it, are those veteran players are are they going to want it that bad? Because there's going to be there's a lot of young piranhas out there who want it that bad, and if you don't want it as bad as they do, they're going to eat you right up. I mean, honestly, I'm speaking my honest opinion, I think uh, in North America, the best player is Jesse Cotton, and as long as he's ambitious and hungry, I think that's going to remain the same. Yeah, I mean, Jesse, um, he's all about innovation. So innovation really wins, and he understands innovation and data. And if you're able to understand those two things, you're going to see a lot of success in anything in this game, Yu-Gi-Oh! or, you know, whatever field you decide to apply that logic to. You know, I, I do think that there is, like, upcoming names that could be added to that conversation down the road. But I think what's going to hold them back is their personalities and their attitudes, right? Because, like, I think... What a lot of people don't understand is this is a game of opinions, right? Where, like, there's not much to go off on to solidify you as the guy, you know, the go, the best, right? A lot of it's just public opinions and perceptions and stuff. And I think a lot of these guys who play and, you know, do their things, yeah, you you want a regional. Or, yeah, you're dominating regionals with your tops back and back to back to back to back. But your personality being shitty is going to hold you back and your public perception. So I definitely think competitive players on the higher up echelon should definitely, you know, self-reflect and, and consciously be aware of their public perceptions because, you know, if you want that recognition, you know, if, if, if you're in it for the, 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 you know, the trophies and stuff, and it's going to take help. It, it's going to take acknowledgement and, you know, how you carry yourself matters. I, uh, I disagree with that statement, actually, believe it or not. I think you should care about nothing what other people think of you and you should just care about what you perceive about yourself and keep that mindset care worry about if you can exclude it if you can exclude it for certain circles it's kind of hard to progress in this game though is it so okay let's use an example right when you're play testing if you want to play test against good players on a high level to get full value of the play testing right you want to be on good standards with good players, do you not? Um, I would argue. See, no, this is an argument I have. I, uh, you can be friends with players who have good <laughs> mindsets. You know, I, I would argue you shouldn't be friends with the your true, true competitors. You shouldn't be that insightful with them because that's your competition right there. And uh, I don't want to give them feedback or anything. I don't want. Yeah, but, I don't want them to know a single dang thing about what I'm thinking before a tournament. So I would argue. I would argue no. You know, I, I keep my circle very close. Are they the best players to play this game? No. Um, but I do know they know how to play this game, and uh, I think just being able to do research on the game is where you can gain that information from. And I think a lot of players just worry too much about how other people feel about them. And but being prepared what, for an event. You know, but being prepared for prevent is, is priority number one. So if you're excluding yourself from conversations with people you deem as good players, right, um, don't you put yourself in a position where you walk into an event and they're playing a particular archetype you're unaware of and unprepared for, or they're playing a specific, you know, rotation of hand traps or, you know, main deck options or staples they're playing that others are not. Like, like for example, when Jesse Cotton came with Dryton and he was very familiar with the Dryton matchups with everybody else, he knows the combos, you know, he knows how to pilot correctly, right? Wouldn't you be, uh, wouldn't you prefer to be aware of that matchup or how the deck operates before going to that event? Yeah, um, so I have a good example. There was a YCS Knoxville. This was when Crusadia Thunder Dragon. This is kind of when it was like the hearing and people were talking about, hey, we're going to mix Crusadias with the Thunder Dragon strategy. Um, I'm not in with the big players or anything, but I think a big aspect is just walking around the room, seeing what people are doing, you know, the day before a tournament, you know, just kind of be insightful. And this is, goes back to the watching when I was talking about being a student of the game compared to being a player of the game. Uh, what you can do in like during COVID instead of like you know going on watching tables on like Friday, seeing what people are doing, um, just watch games on Dueling Book and understand their strategies. Because honestly, sure, they maybe had this new hot tech for like that tournament or something. But if you're actually an informed player and a student of the game, you should know about that tech. You shouldn't be learning that tech from them. You're you knew about that tech already way in advance. 
So mm-hmm. I would argue you shouldn't be relying on these big name players to do that. If you want to consider yourself a big name player, you knew about that already. And if you don't know about that already, you're you're behind. You know, like you're you're doing something <laughs> wrong in your research process. Then that's on you. I don't think you shouldn't be getting that information from someone else because. And if you do, keep a close circle, not a circle. It doesn't have to be the best players, but a close circle, ones who you trust and ones that you can play test with. And I wouldn't even say, like, just, just guys you can have fun with, you know, guys or girls, you know, um, people who you just enjoy spending time with. And I think that will go a longer way in being a student of the game. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. I mean, if your circle, if your circle uh, is bouncing ideas with you, right, then I guess uh, your philosophy can work as long as they're not being a vacuum and just coming to you seeking knowledge and information yeah. instead so of providing it. Then, yeah, that could definitely work. Yeah, it's always you know. about uh, asking feedback. I, I know from my personal circle, um, I always ask for feedback on things. And we like to review <laughs> more of actual in-gameplay footage and reasons why they're losing or reasons why we're winning. And we break down exact moments inside the game compared to actually just, you know, throwing the cards out there. We like to set up more situations that are, you know, for the game. Like, you know, say we're playing, we we'll act like we have hand traps and we don't have hand traps because we want to see what is the impact of that hand trap, you know, or something. Like, if, like, say we brick, we like to just act like our hand has cards, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Just different ways like that, I think, in play. <laughs> Testing, but uh, I don't think I think that's something maybe too many players do, and I think that's their issue with a lot of players. They rely on these bigger name players to uh, then shape the meta. But why are you shaping the meta? Why are you relying on someone else to do it? So you're admitting that that's that you can't do it yourself. You need to define yourself. You need you need to define the game. If you want to be successful at this game, you need to go out there and you need to define it, not someone else. I respect that. I respect that. Do you believe in tasty backsies and playtesting? And take backs, you said? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I let someone take back like eight moves if you want to in testing. Or like eight, eight like I, I like to go back. Like if I made a mistake, I, I will go back. And I, Or if like they made a mistake, I'll make them go back. Because I want the most correct play to always be made against me during playtesting. And you should as well. It's not about winning in playtesting. If you care one second about winning in playtesting, you're doing something incorrectly. And what about the, the, the person who's playing? What about uh, hammering the mistakes out of them, though? Because if people get used to taking back moves, what happens when they go to a real event? They can't do that, right? So how do you, how do you balance that out? Under, understand the difference between playtesting and playing competitively. Um, you know, there's just every, anything, you know, you need to be able to break. I think, like, you, you said the Smash community. You know, you practice different moves with the Smash community. You, you, you go over to make sure that move is successful over and over and over and over again to make sure you know you have that. Uh, it's the same thing with Yu-Gi-Oh! You know, like, of course, you're not going to keep doing that move over and over again like in the Smash Brothers. But just understanding and mastering the move that you're trying to perform can go a long way. I think there's a lot of knowledge of gems and stuff for this podcast episode. Definitely. Today. I just want to thank you, Jared, for that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure having you guys. I appreciate it. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot people can say about you, but what they can't say is that you're not informed, you're not knowledgeable, and you're not talented in this game. They cannot say that. I appreciate that. I think it's just being a student of the game. Honestly, I think that's everything. Just trying to gain as much information as possible, absorbing that, and then just trying to apply that, you know, over and over again. Yeah. Are there any words you want to give to our viewers who and listeners that, you know, who, who've been playing for a long time and can't get it done or those who just started playing and want to be the next guy? Like, yeah. what would you tell them? So I would, I would tell them one word, and I would, I would put it up as accountability. And uh, be accountable for your actions, whether that be in real life or be accountable of anything that you would have inside the game. Stop putting blame on other things. Uh, put blame on why you lost that game. And put that blame on yourself. Don't put that blame on, oh, I just didn't have the cards or anything else. You need to put yourself as accountable. Mm-hmm. I, can, I totally agree with you. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is this is going to be the wrap up for this episode. Uh, 
I'm Cody Edwards. This is Bill. Yo. Special guest Jared Zimmerman for Woodpath Gaming. Um, and the comment in the, in, the, in the comment section below, tell us what you thought. Uh, if you have any questions, throw them out there. Uh, in the description, I'll be plugging um, Jared's YouTube channel. Uh, what's in your channel, Jared? One of the station. I just do some deck profiles when I go to events with friends. I'm not really too much. Uh, but if you do want to follow something I do do on Instagram, follow me. Prismatic Shadow Games. I like to upload just some daily photos, whatever Yu-Gi-Oh shenanigans is happening. More like a repost blog Instagram. But it has like a, like over 500 followers. And I just started it this year. So Prismatic Shadow Games. All right. Okay, I'll put, the, I'll put that plug in in the description below. Uh, I'll also be plugging in our TCG player in uh, the description below. Uh, with some other stuff, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch. Facebook, whatever. You know, Twitch too. We got some new Twitch streamers coming up. Um, I'm Cody. Um, this is Plus Guys Game Podcast. We out. Laters. Yeah.